and I'm here today with Dr. Alan Rayner. Welcome, welcome, Alan. Uh, and thank you for having me. It's uh, good to meet up with you. Yes, I'm excited. Uh, Alan is an evolutionary ecologist, a writer, an artist, and you know, just on the path of you know, regeneration for for a long time. And so, I'm excited to learn, to listen, and to to hear about this journey and the the fascination and the passion um, that you have for you know the natural world and the intelligence that the natural world carries. Yeah. Maybe we don't have to go as far back as the first moment that you realize this is going to be your, 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 your path, right? But, but, do, but, but do share, Alan, like, what were some of those clicking moments where, where you realized, like, this is more important than anything else that, um, that, that could, you know, kind of take your attention? Yeah, well, I mean, the big, the big change came around the turn of the millennium. <clears throat> And up until then, I'd sort of gone through a fairly standard academic career. Mm. Um, I was a lecturer, a reader at the University of Bath in biology. Um, and I'd got there via quite a, you know, via King's College, Cambridge and, and, and so on. So I'd, I'd followed a very standard path really uh, towards, you know, an academic career. Um, but I felt all along that path, I felt un more and more and more uncomfortable until really around the turn of the millennium or 90, in fact, in the year 1999, mm. I broke because there was too much of an inconsistency between what I was expected to do as an academic and as a biologist and uh, and what I actually felt inwardly, uh, and it also was associated as as you when you feel not exactly as though you as though you don't really belong in a situation, it affects your con your confidence. So I had a crisis of confidence in what I was doing, and during that during a period of about six months. I reviewed my life up until then and slowly began to work out what it was that was making me so uncomfortable. And my life up and then, up until then, well, really I started, I went on the path to biology because my father introduced me to natural history. He took me out for walks with him. He took me on fungus forays. I learned to name, I learned the Latin names of a huge number of fungi and plants by the, you know, as a teenager. And I went out with him on these explorations with groups of people and we shared knowledge. And I absolutely loved the experience. And I found that I, I got a very strong feeling then for the natural world. And as a result of that experience, I, I took the academic path into biology and ultimately into mycology, which is his area of, of special interest. But when it came to trying to be a, what, a, a traditional scientist within that discipline, something didn't click at all. And especially in the area of evolution, and in the area of ecology, I became more and more disconcerted by the idea of the selfish gene, quite honestly, as, mm -hmm. as developed by Richard Dawkins. And the idea that, you know, we are no more than, <clears throat> uh, in a sense, <laughs> human information processes mm -hmm. with selfish genes mm. clashed completely with my own fundamental values of compassion, reasonableness, <laughs> and honesty. I felt that, you know, there was something going on and I, and I increasingly sensed a dishonesty within that academic community. Uh, not so much a conscious dishonesty, but nonetheless a dishonesty. Yeah, a bias. And it was representing the natural world and e the evolutionary process in a way that didn't make sense to me and still doesn't make sense to me. 
And I actually find it very hard to watch natural history programs on the TV because they are still promulgating this basic idea <coughs> of Darwinian selection, mm -hmm. which ultimately I realize doesn't make any sense at all. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't even work as a mechanism in, in physics, in mechanical physics terms. It doesn't work because it's retrospective. <laughs> and a real me mechanism isn't retrospective, it's instantaneous. So something was wrong. And I slowly worked out what was wrong. And it was to do actually, most fundamentally, with the perception of the self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and it actually comes out of a way of looking at the world, in science especially, an objective way of looking at the world, which essentially isolates the observer from the observed. And in that sense of isolation of the self from the world in which you inhabit, arises a sense of conflict. So I started to ask myself, well, where does my self begin and end? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, would, that would send anyone on a longer journey. Yeah. Right? And so essentially, I began to realize, well, I might, and it, it then took me right back to something I understood as an infant. And it happened because I was an infant in Kenya mm -hmm. at the time of the Mau Mau rebellion or uprising. It was a very scary time to be an infant. My mother was a politician. She was actually deputy mayor of Nairobi. She actually knew quite well the first prime minister of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta. It made her a target. But amongst other things that she did, which was extraordinary, was that she used to organize sharing circles in her living room, mm. inviting in all, all representatives from all the different political arenas, essentially whites, blacks, Asians, whatever, the whole lot, all brought together into a sharing circle. It was an, you know, as I look at it now, it's quite an extraordinary thing that she did. Mm -hmm. And her idea was to bring all these points of view together into a common focus. And I sat there with her as an infant. And I remember this extraordinary sense that I had <clears throat> suddenly of, I'm just as much included in what these people are seeing <laughs> as they are included in what I'm seeing. Mm. Okay, so I'm just as much in their world, yeah, as they are in my world. And immediately you have this sense of an, in, an in, inward and outward relationship, which gives you both a sort of sense of discernment of the difference, but at the same time, a very strong sense of commonality. And at that moment came also a sense of the inner soul within everybody. Wow. And I remember it. I was, a, like a I was a tiny, moment. tiny infant, and I remember it. Hmm. And actually, that's what returned to me <laughs> in, the, in 1999, as I was going through this. You know, you cannot isolate a self from its neighborhood. You, you, the self is a natural inclusion of its neighborhood. You know, and how I am, my identity, you know, self-identity naturally includes the neighborhood you're in. So my, my actual identity will change depending on the circumstance I'm in, just straightforwardly. So the very idea <clears throat> of a self which is isolated <laughs> off from its surroundings doesn't make sense. It's essentially a, a pure abstraction, literally an abstraction Right, which all of reductionist science is based on. Which all of reductionist science makes this reduction. But it's equally not sort of a, a total merger because there is still the distinction. Yep, we're still individuals, but we have, you know, in other words, we're the same but different. I think this is the hardest part for most people to wrap their mind around, right? Because what, yeah. what you're describing is a, 
uh, like a visceral experience. It's, a, yes. it's almost like a, a consciousness clarity and, and, a, and a cellular truth at the same time. Once That's you've right. experienced that, you kind of can't go back. But if That's you correct. haven't experienced that, what I, what I watch in people's minds sometimes when I have these dialogues with people who, who are quite a bit more skeptical than, than I would be to what you're sharing, um, is there is like a mental um, disconnection it's like yeah. well, my mind can't wrap itself around because in the you know the worldview that many people still hold, what you're saying doesn't really make sense unless I'm challenging everything that I thought I was. Yeah. Which in this world that is you know unfortunately still based on a lot of domination and destruction. Yeah. I think this would be a great thing to challenge everything we thought we knew. You know. Yeah. Well, this is essentially what I realized. And so the idea is that the self, you know, essentially has an inner and an outer dimension. The inner dimension is local and the outer dimension is infinite. Mm. And, wow, and, that's that, yeah. and so, and actually, you know, it then made me think, as you know, I, I met several people who suddenly made me think about space. <laughs> or nothingness, or mm. the void. The void, yeah. The void. And essentially what emerged was you sort of, I suddenly you sort of thought, because up until that time, I'd become aware, I'd, 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 you know, about boundaries and the way we think about boundaries. And I'd made the move from thinking about boundaries as definitive cutoffs between inside and outside, which is in a sense the way where brought up to think, especially mathematically and philosophically, rationalistically, we, 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 we're, everybody is trying to define everything, including ourselves. Mm. And this, this idea of the boundary as a sort of cut between the inner world and the outer world, well, uh, biologically, it makes absolutely no sense, because if we did that, we'd, we, we'd die, <laughs> because we are utterly dependent on a supply of energy coming from outside inwards and yeah excuse me to, to jump in there this is the exciting part why i you know i was so uh looking forward to having you on the show alan is because it's not just all a mental or esoteric or consciousness perspective it is a biological reality and let's let's unpack this quite a bit more but biology actually shows us that right like if i were to go back into my uh indoctrinated school brain it's like all plants compete for sunlight. Well, really they don't, right? Because sunlight is abundantly there and the, the different shades and levels of sunlight that plants and bushes and grasses get, now they, they share it back through the mycelium and the, the root system. And so biology shows us what you're explaining so eloquently yeah. as a, a baseline of, of, of reality. And so this is, I think, where maybe the way through for many people, you know, tuning in and also in the future, uh, really onboarding into this as the path forward is, is that we can witness it in biology. Yeah, well, this was to me the extraordinary thing was as a biologist, it was plain obvious mm. to me that our, our living system boundaries are dynamic and, per and variably permeable. And the, the relationship between in the inner and the outer mediated by a dynamic boundary is what life is all about. And you only have to think about, you know, the plasma membrane of a cell and how it functions to realize that and how that scales up to multicellular bodies <clears throat> and all the rest of it. And so to me, it was a complete enigma of how can you be a biologist and know that and yet be talking about selection as if you're dealing with discrete units that are operated on by an external selective force. You know, and there was, there was this phrase which is very much associated with selfish gene type thinking or Darwinian type thinking, quite honestly which is all about, well, what is the unit of selection? So actually, the, and, and this is what led to the identification of the gene as the unit of the selection, the bit, yeah, the, the object of a mechanical force outside, which is somehow deciding what's good and what's bad. 
And of course, it doesn't make any sense at all because mm. life isn't like that. Life, you know, life forms grow <laughs> and they die, and and you know, and they have a, a process of development. And especially if you're looking at trees and fungi, their development is utterly open-ended. You know, as, as you know, fungi can, as now, as is quite well known, can begin can can what can inhabit. Um, square kilometers of area as an individual. So, you know, having been growing and growing and growing inexorably for thousands of years. So, and, and trees similarly, you know, that we can begin to, to recognize this, particularly actually in, in the Pacific Northwest as it happens. And, um, you know, so, the, so there's this idea that I had that of, you know, actually an indeterminacy you know, the organisms cannot be treated as if they're isolated entities that are literally sorted out by some sort of external retrospective mechanism which decides what's good and what's bad. But then actually in a continual dialogue, continual process of attunement, as I prefer to call it, not adaptation, mm -hmm. because adaptation is one way, but attunement with their surroundings. The big Analogy for that, I, I found was in river systems. Mm -hmm. Basically, a river both shapes and is shaped by the landscape simultaneously. Yeah, it's not just following a path of least resistance; it's creating a path of least resistance. Totally. So we've got this, this inner outer relationship mediated through the banks of or boundaries of a river system, which is exactly analogous to how organisms work. And it's a beautiful example because it, it's also never done, right? A river keeps uh, breathing in that sense. Yes. Like it gets bigger or smaller depending on the season. That's exactly the right. So, so I developed that, mm. that understanding. Actually, I wrote a book about it called Degrees of Freedom, Living in Dynamic Boundaries, and that was mm. published in 1997. But then I started... You know, during this period of, of introspection, I started thinking, well, what, how can boundaries be dynamic? And then someone sort of said something to me, which made me think about space. <laughs> Void space. Mm. And I suddenly had an, I had literally had a moment of enlightenment or enlightenment or whatever you want to call mm. it, but, but one of those moments, and a eureka moment, an aha moment. And I thought, space, the zero viscosity solvent of the universe. Hmm. Literally everywhere, a, a, not an absence of presence, but a presence of absence, <laughs> which actually enables, you know, it welcomes, it's receptive to movement. It is itself still intangible, frictionless, but in so being, it is also receptive. And so suddenly I began to think, okay, so now we can understand all matter actually <laughs> as an energetic configuration of space. And essentially rationalistic thinking inserts a false cut between the inner and the outer, <clears throat> as I've already suggested. It suggests either that space and matter are mutually exclusive, <laughs> so that, or that they're one and the same. So essentially that's the sort of system of logic that dates right back to Aristotle and before, uh, called dualism. Um, essentially the divorce <laughs> of space from matter or alternatively the materialization of space you know as if it's all one and actually no it can't be like that it's actually that everybody yeah you know all all form is essentially flow form it actually all, all all form is a mutual inclusion of space and matter and the only way that can happen is if boundaries are formed the boundaries of of, of bodies are formed dynamically because if they stopped basically it would fall, you know something would fall apart so it's like thinking about a whirlpool the form of the whirlpool depends on circulation 
around a receptive center, like the eye of the storm, or any of those kinds of ideas. And you suddenly realize, okay, well, that, what that means is that a material body can't exist in zero time. And then it takes you very, very, very deep indeed into the, into the, into the basics of, of, of physics. Mm -hmm. And into this the, so and, and in, yeah, and into why, you know, people, you know, particle physicists are actually continually struggling because they're trying to objectify what can't be objective, which, is, which can't be, you know, they're trying to define something that literally can't be defined because it's dynamically organized. Mm -hmm. And that applies to ourselves, and it applies to the why it is that we are dynamic inclusions of our neighborhood. And that immediately says, well, it, nature is everywhere. We are dynamic inclusions of nature, not, not, not parts of a whole or any of those ideas, but we are dynamic inclusions of nature, which is everywhere. So we're dynamic inclusions somewhere of nature, which is everywhere. And uh, it's very, very simple, ultimately. Uh, but it's very, very unfamiliar to many people. That's the part that, you know, I, I, I still find both fascinating as well as frustrating is I don't even personally believe it is unfamiliar to anyone because we're no. all experiencing no. it. But yeah. there's, there seems to be something in, you know, the way, um, without digressing about geopolitics and why the world is the way the way the way it is but the way our minds get programmed into this delusion or this 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 um this perception of 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 you know re reductionism dualism uh mechanical universe and at the same time you know everyone's experienced the observer bias before you're a dynamic part of what happens like it's it's just yeah. what it's just really how reality it's, forms it's it's it's, it's totally obvious it it really can be and so that's why uh, in my own life I, I come back to how simple it can be in regeneration for me it seems to be a principle of life and then you said it so eloquently this principle of life is really what we're looking for is this dynamic uh, part yeah. that forms the world so yeah maybe you know i like to ask this question what would it take for humanity to learn from its past mistakes to really understand it's time to um make it so far that the official narrative uh, can change. What I mean with that is you probably encountered a lot of pushback in your academic career with, with this kind of worldview. And so yes. at some point though, you know, it seems to me that, that those times need to be over. Like what would it take, do you believe, to actually have this resolution uh, to these ac academic opinions and-, and yeah. Make well, a step forward. I think it requires, you know, in 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 a, another scientific idea, idea critical mass. Mm. Essentially, sufficient people need to be understanding this mm. for it to for the for the understanding literally to snowball. So is that you know, instead of everybody saying, well, you know, push it, instead of this incredible resistance, which yes, I have encountered huge resistance, mm. even hostility, even mm. all sorts of quite nastiness, actually. So it's actually been very hard. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but, but, uh, but when people actually think, come to realize this and begin to realize it sort of en masse so that it actually becomes a literally common knowledge, then the old view will just seem absolutely ridiculous. I did actually write a poem this morning. <laughs> Let's hear it. Because I was sort of, uh, I was sort of, uh, sort of anticipating what I might say, and it's actually totally relevant to what you've been asking. So I will read it to you, mm -hmm. if you like. I would it won't take long. It's a short one. It's called "To Be an Exception" or "To Be an Inclusion." That is the question that throws the rationalizing mind into utter confusion, arising from the delusion that space can be cut into cubicles. What a laugh, or at least it would be, 
if it didn't lead to such dismal conclusion in the ending of life in dearth. When in reality, it's clear for all to see, quite honestly, that everybody is both dynamically distinct from and included within the continuous space, the universal grace, within, without, and throughout where it occurs temporarily. That's it. But it's just that that poem actually expresses that switch from the view of the self as an exception from where it is. Bravo. To, I, I to a dynamic that. inclusion of where it is. Now that's it. I love the term dynamic inclusion there, Ellen. And you know, something that podcasting with the modern technology of being on a Zoom with someone, you're sitting in the UK, I'm sitting in you know, the Pacific Northwest, Songhees First Nations Territory, what, what we call Canada. It makes me very aware at times that we're, we're connecting over the airwaves, so to speak, right? Like yeah. th there is, there is a, a participation in the, the planet Earth that is being created today. Your participation or sharing about this, my participation in, in lit everyone who's tuning in is also co-creating this moment, even though you listening might be tuning in a year later, you're still co-creating this moment. Yes. So that's how for me, inclusion sometimes becomes very vi visible. Yes. You know, because yes. as a, as a, you know, podcaster who I, I host events and, and love, you know, meeting people at uh, immersions or masterminds and someone comes up to me and says, Hey, I've listened to your episode with, with Dr. Allen then it, in my mind, I, I can't help but understand that in this moment, we've created a bridge that was visible and accessible from someone else who was basically participating in the field already in this moment right now. Yeah, It's a little bit too much for my mind, but it, 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 it connects me to a feel, like a feeling of, I don't know if it's love, but it's a feeling of, it's, it's almost pleasure. It's a feeling of satisfaction. Yes. And the reason I'm sharing this is because Again, like one thing is to further the reality, realities that we've learned in school or that we've been told. But then the, another thing is to become aware of how we participate in the creative experience of reality. And so exactly. that's where it really dawned on me years ago is that this all seems to be way more interconnected than, than we were yeah. told. Yeah. I even, I even sort of, <coughs> one of the things that sort of, is, is slightly problematic about the way I go about things is that I even think it's really not so much about connection because that immediately makes your, your mind think material linkage. Mm. It's actually about, it, it truly is about receptive, responsive relationship. You see, mm. we're in a dialogue at the moment and that dialogue is being mediated through a spatial channel. It's not a connect, connection as such, actually. <laughs> there's a channel, there's an, there's, a, there's an opening of space between us, you know, which is being channeled. <laughs> so it's not a thread, it's a, it's a pipe. <laughs> so I tend, to talk, I tend to sort of be very, very careful, especially as soon, because you're wanting to, people to understand space as actually not what it's always been sold to us as, as a gap that mm -hmm. things have to cross, but actually as the pool that we are all co-inhabiting. And it's actually not only that, but it's a receptive pool. Yeah? So it's actually literally pooling us together. And we even have a name for that. It's called gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so in the sense, what, what we really are is inter-influenced. Yeah, well, so you know, we're and we're reciproc. Yeah, we're within each other's in spirit at the moment. We, through the medium of of the internet, you and I are <clears throat> within each other's spheres of influence, mm -hmm. just like I was as an infant in my mother's sharing circle. We were included in each other's world, mm -hmm. but what was actually including us was not some sort of tangible linkage it was space itself mm. because space itself is infinite intangible offers no resistance to movement so it's actually this switch from thinking about space and boundaries as sources of discontinuity 
which is how we've all been taught, to understanding of the sources of continuity and dynamic distinction. Okay, so but space is, a, is literally a source of receptive continuity everywhere. And boundaries, as we've described, are dynamic distinctions which allow unique individual bodies to form. So every, every, every individual body is unique, and yet we are co-inhabiting a pool, a receptive pool of common space. Mm -hmm. so, it's also so interesting to see when, let, let's say we have, we take twins or siblings, right, that have very similar genetic blueprints, but then the reality of who they become throughout um, their life is basically dependent on the, the epigenetic markers and the expressions of that, right? Like the way yes. they interplay with reality. Yes. And it becomes yes. obvious at some point, because even if you were twins, you might 45 years later not even look alike anymore, you know? No, no, of course not. Because essentially, this is this is about the relationship between content and context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and content, you know, and and essentially, content is always contextual. So and that, yeah, so that we're always, ex, you know, we're dynamic inclusions and expressions of our context of our our habitat, not exception. It's again taking us back to that difference between being an exception. <laughs> which has to make a bridge to other exceptions mm -hmm. through interconnection or actually being dynamic inclusions. We're already in, within one another's <coughs> sphere of influence. And, and, you know, that even extends to understanding the fundamental nature of gravity, which physicists still struggle with because you, how, are, how are electromagnetism and gravity related well of course we're really talking about darkness and light or space and and flux mm. and that's how they're related receptive as receptive responsive participate and co-participants in a co-creative process which you've almost i did you know you, as, as you were speaking i heard you saying that in your own way and in your own well, you see, this is the interesting thing about when we when we go into philosophy and consciousness that then is the the ground floor for for science and observation and 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 truth in that sense is that we're all connected, as you said. We're in an like a you know in, in, not interconnected, but like yeah, an, we're interinfluenced. Yeah, inter we're, we're all in the same space, pool, yes. but we're in the same pool, and yeah that becomes very visible when we look at how the old power dynamics have stayed alive for so long, because if we're inter-influenced and someone is broadcasting a very strong influence in that inter-influenced space. Now that's one thing, right? But then on the other hand, we all deeply already know it's not about who is the smartest kid who knows it's more about how do we now leverage this to create and co-create co-facilitate a planet earth, a reality that is, yeah, a baseline for thriving, you know, a baseline exactly. for thriving for the human species and for all of the natural kingdom, which we are very obviously uh, an integral part of, right? Yeah. We're not, we're not against it or, you know, fi fighting against the harsh world of nature. And so this is, this is a question I have for you, Alan, is what's your, you know, given your, your, your deep understanding, knowledge and like philosophical brilliance and being able to put this into words as well, What's your dream for planet Earth for seven generations forward that that we we leverage this into, you know, I mean, this is maybe I'm choosing the wrong words, but to materialize a world yeah. that is that is reflective of us understanding these principles. Yes, well, I mean, one of the ways I look, I think of about it is actually fundamentally in terms of moving <laughs> from a notion of greedfulness <laughs> to needfulness. <clears throat> as soon as we understand that, you know, we are dynamic inclusions and expressions of our neighborhood, that we immediately understand that actually we, may, we are motivated primarily by need. You know, we actually need an influx of energy in order to live. And so, you know, when you see a lion consuming its prey, it's not doing it because it's against its prey or 
hating its prey. It's doing it because it's hungry, mm. because it's motivated by an inner receptivity says, I'm hungry. <laughs> and that's actually very, very different from the notion of a self of selfishness. It's actually a, a notion of needfulness. And when we understand that we are all needful in this sense, mm. that breeds compassion because we immediately understand one another and, and one another's motivations, primarily in terms of what we need. And so what I'm looking at is as that understanding develops, we start to be able to be those three values that I mentioned earlier, honesty, that is, we're, you know, we are committed to truth. Reasonableness, which means actually making sense, not paradox, which is what rationalism does. And compassion, the compassion come. And so essentially, we're, we're and it's truly about empathy, because, you know, we are understanding one another in the same way as we understand ourselves, which is, of course, a very old idea of love your neighbor as yourself not instead of yourself but as yourself <laughs> um so that's that's a very very old but it's actually but it actually makes total sense as soon as what we understand ourselves as needful vulnerable biological pre you know organizations and so that institutes and i got that feeling you see in that sharing circle with my mother mm. of a sense of care a duty of care for to the other and a duty of care for our neighborhood so this is all about caring and sharing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so in other words the kind of community that i'm looking at for here is a, a caring sharing community which understands its situation properly doesn't make up stories about it that are false and literally loves one another yeah that is our superpower right is that yeah. that a love expressed as caring and or in other words the the power of the people actually yes yes um, without the distraction of stories you said something very interesting there you, you you spoke about the paradox and that rationalism breeds the paradox yes it does i would love to hear a few more words on that because you know if if you were to re-listen to an average uh, amount of episodes after this one that I've recorded before, I often speak about the paradox being like a byproduct of being alive in this world. Like you can't live today without being somewhat paradoxical in the sense that I might have deeply ecological um, awareness, desires, dreams, but I still take an airplane to get to another place, which we know is not necessarily the best act for the, the environment. How, yeah, I mean, is a, yeah, a I, I think, well. yes, I mean, it's very interesting. The kind of paradox mm -hmm. I'm speaking of is the kind of, ultimately, the kind of paradox that arises from either regarding sp literally space and matter as one and the same, in which case you could have no form. You know, we, we basically have homogeneity. Or as regarding space and matter to be separate. And, you, if, and if that was the case, you know, the, the way I often put it to such to people is this, is can you imagine yourself, your own, yourself bodily devoid of space? Where would you be? Where would you be if your body had contained no space? You'd be nowhere. Mm. Essentially because that which needs to be present to give you volume yeah, has been removed. So you are re reduced to a zero point. Mm -hmm. In my imagination right now. In your imagination like, or even in, you know. Um, yeah, but there was no space for even breathing if I wasn't in well, space. Well, that's right. right. I mean, basically, you know, yeah. I mean, and on the other hand, try to imagine a reality that was pure space. There was no It would be formless. Form. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, we immediately understand that, you know, that <laughs> each necessarily includes the other. Yeah. Mm. Light necessarily includes shadow or whatever, you know, it's that sort of relationship. 
And that's not paradoxical, that's totally understandable. The paradox comes from assuming otherwise that somehow, you know, that, that matter can be isolated from space. Mm -hmm. Well, as we've just discussed, it can't be without disappearing into a zero point. And yet, think about computing now, think about digital computing, it's a zero or one. That's immediately paradoxical, mm -hmm. yeah? Because in reality, the zero is inside one as a dynamic inclusion of infinity, yeah? So, and this is quite important mathematically. In fact, ridiculously important mathematically <clears throat> because it's essentially, record, you know, it's a transformation of mathematics to understand geometrically that everybody, as I once put it in a poem, everybody is a cavity at heart, is ultimately, you know, the zero point is necessarily within the figure, within the infinite. And, um, but we have a system of, of mathematics that sort of splits something from nothing. And it gives rise to paradox, one of the most famous paradoxes of all is known as the Crete and Lyre paradox, where an inhabitant of Crete tells you that all inhabitants of Crete are liars. And your mind goes into a spin, because essentially that's a self-contradiction. Okay, and it, but a self-contradiction arises out of an imposed definition which doesn't exist. Hmm. So in other words, it's, it's, it's rooted in it's an axiomatic problem. And that related, you know, someone who sort of understood that in the 1930s, but went a long way around about proving it was, was Kurt Gödel. Mm. And, you know, we have Gödel's theorem of incompleteness, <laughs> which is actually recognizing the paradox of imposing definition. Yeah, imposing a definitive boundary around an object because essentially it cuts it off from what enables it to be an object. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I love how, you know, it's still quite complex maybe for for some people to, to wrap their minds around, but how eloquent and simple you're able to express some of these more complex conundrums that... Yeah, it's taken I mean, a lot of practice. <laughs> yeah, I bet, but it, you know, I also, I also see that this has, you know, this is something I, I I was able to see for many years now, based on being a, a global nomad who's who's grown up in different cultures and yeah. looked for different cultures because you kind of start seeing this similar paradox that you're only what you thought you were based on what you were told that you are, and then once you're somewhere else, you're not necessarily that. You, you're you're in a dynamic expression of what you're choosing and what the environment around you presents you. Exactly. You're, you're growing up in Kenya and living in the UK now probably have a few of those intercultural um, yes. moments as well. And, and so who would we be as a species if we weren't told anything about this, what this reality is, but if we were all encouraged to just learn about it and figure it out in our first 20 years in, in this body, you know? That's right. And well, essentially this is where the education aspect comes in and becomes very important. And there's something I've actually spent quite a lot of time as an educator thinking about, and I've written about it too. But essentially, there is a necessary transformation of our systems of education. Yes. So that we can get out of this box that we're taught to contain ourselves within and actually recognize, accept, acknowledge what all of us knew as infants. Mm. You know, I knew this as a, as a child, as a baby, but it, you know, what was extraordinary to me was going to school and being taught something which didn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, we share that Especially in mathematics as it happens. Yeah. You know, I hated arithmetic, oh. um, you know, and, and, and you, and, but now I actually understand, well, actually, you know, it's the wrong math, you know, the, it's, a, it's the wrong kind of mathematics or the wrong way to teach mathematics. Mm -hmm. 
because actually, you know, ultimately, you know, and you know, if if you if you teach mathematics axiomatically, yeah, definitively, then it won't make sense because it's basically inserted a discontinuity that doesn't exist. <clears throat> well, many people uh, can can probably relate to that one. That math or physics in school was. A pain uh, maybe now we know yeah and um, yeah i often put it you know i thought i was stupid at, at physics and maths but actually it's That's physics and maths that were stupid and actually the thing that you you sort of immediately you I, I, I sometimes put it just think of yourself back to as if you knew nothing and you suddenly found yourself in the world and you'd recognize immediately, would you not, that there are two kinds of presence, one of which resists your movement, which is material, mm. the other of which permits movement, which is spatial. Mm -hmm. And from that, you can work it out that the, these two aspects of reality are necessary to our very existence. And if you try and remove, remove one from the other, it doesn't make sense. So beautifully put, Alan. This is this has been an, a you know such a deep episode and and such a beautiful um, connection to truth without you know um, need, needing to go into the complex geopolitical state of the world and the indoctrination that happens with it. But but just from a, a simple observation of the, the ecological principles, the regenerative principles, the, the, the energy that life is made up of. And so I'm super grateful for you to, you know, have taken the time and spell that out. And, you know, I, I get the feeling we could keep going for another three hours and there would just continue to be kind of golden nuggets of, of, of that coming through. Um, we've already talked briefly just now about, you know, that the education system at the, at the core of it need, needs to be redefined. You shared a bit of your dream for for the world waking up in or a reawakening to you know these these this this principle of life i will just call it continue to call it but i want to end with one more question on the education system like if you were to you know name one or two additional elements here that that would really help any child or adult to to be on that path of thriving what are those principles that we want to include into education? What do, we, what do we call education currently? Well, I actually taught a course at Bath University called Life and Environment and People, in which I introduced these ideas to, and it was transdisciplinary. Okay, so, and, in, and right at the heart of that course was sharing. Mm -hmm. So that instead of, you know, although I would, I would lead a conversation, I would open a conversation, but I would encourage a sharing circle to develop so that the students themselves could learn from each other, as well as from me. I could only offer my experience. Sometimes I used to put it in terms of teaching as a Sherpa guide to the territory, not as an, not as an instructor, but actually as a guide to the territory. And the principle of the sharing circle is very, very important indeed, because it's also a political principle. It's also true democracy. <laughs> true, demo I don't know, uh, true, democracy to, true democracy is about bringing all angles of view together into a common place. It is not about binary opposition. So there are no true democracies in the world at national level, none. When I hear America, I'm, when I hear people boasting that we have a democratic system as, and you've got a parliament divided between, you know, government and opposition, that's bollocks, beg your pardon. But it really is absolute nonsense because that is a political system which will create opposition, it will create resentment, it will allow those who lose to feel bad and those yeah. who win to be triumphalist mm -hmm. so well it's very smartly designed let's put it this way to and, keep us, yeah, and keep us looped in that yeah. loop right yeah, yeah and what you said and, is so so brilliant is like the and this passion 
I've met so many people now, you included and myself included as well, where this passion also is nourished by quite a strong, uh, you know, frustration or this, this despise of, of the systems that have been created that are such as abstractions of nature yes. that are inherently never going to lead to anything that we truly desire because they're not based on what you just said, the inclusion and the principle of sharing. Like this example you made of your, uh, your mother's gathering with, with the circular structure. This is an ancient indigenous way of, of meeting. It's, Indeed it is. Yes. When we come into circle and hear all the voices, it might be. That is know, the like, true democracy. Yes. Yeah, it might be exhausting sometimes and it might be requiring a lot of patience, but really, truly, it creates a different reality. It does. Yeah. It does. Alan, thank you so much for being on Green Planet, Blue Planet. Um, this this broadcast is going to keep casting into the world uh, for <laughs> for for the time forward. I'm super grateful for meeting you today and for recording this, for getting your insights. Um, I'm going to make sure to link out also Advaya. Um, there's lots and lots of uh, learning opportunities online with you and with with the groups of people you've you've gathered. Um, is there any last thing you want to share? Any any kind of thought that that's coming up, or anything special that you want people to know? Yeah, just that we're not against one another. Just that. That's a beautiful, beautiful remark to close the episode on. Um, we're better together. Thank you so much, Alan. Okay, thank, thank you for uh, being together with me.